I came across a 19th century French postcard that said radium heating. I was very interested in it. Let's find out together whether it is true or false. A series of pictures called Enlon 2000 in the year 2000, or as it is also called, France in the year 2000, was created by several illustrators. These cards were inserted in cigarette and cigar boxes. The first of them were printed back in 1899 in anticipation of the 1900 Paris World's Fair. Let us consider what a fireplace is. A distinctive feature of the fireplace is that it is not designed for heating and subsequent heat transfer from the wall material. The main heat it gives due to infrared radiation from the flame and convection, there is nothing to do. Those who have ever had a fireplace know that convection causes only problems. Smoke starts to go out, polluting the air and the fireplace itself. With a large volume of room to warm it up, you have to sit near the fireplace for several hours. And what were they made for if they initially do not cope with their tasks? Well, obviously not for beauty. Perhaps the climate in the northern latitudes was milder. But the fireplace, nevertheless, has a chimney. Specialists will confirm that in warm climates, it is even more difficult to sink a fireplace because of the reverse draft. So what is it for then? Well, let's find out. So, fireplace. The more ancient it is, the more it resembles the design of a canopy over a fire, which is built directly on the floor. In addition, the height of the firebox on fireplaces of old construction is higher than human height. In this case, even with a good draft, half of the smoke will go out into the room. As you can see, all fireplaces have one thing in common. It is the presence of a metal plate on the back wall of the firebox which serves to emit infrared rays when heating, strictly in front of itself, as it should be a fireplace, and a what are the metal cups near the fireplaces. And the cups can be of different sizes. The largest ones are placed at the corners of the fireplace. What do these cups remind you of? Yes, all right, sports cups, which apparently we don't use in the right way. Let us imagine that a metal bond runs down the chimney stack from the roof of the building, as in the figure and arrives at the thick conductor formed by the frame at the entrance to the firebox of the fireplace. This frame is metallically bonded to the stove that is on the back wall. This connection may be single conductors, or it may be continuous. When the goblets are placed in close proximity to the frame, a strong eddy current begins to be induced in the frame. This current generates eddy currents also in the plate on the back wall concentrating in the center of the plate, so the strength of the current was such that the metal there glowed and began to radiate heat. There are a lot of photos of such poles with cups from the 14th century. This is nothing but a kind of pole without wires. Their main task is to transmit to a distance oscillations of atmospheric electricity systems, and these cups are nothing else but the device for concentration of atmospheric electricity. We will talk about atmospheric electricity some other time. Let's go back to the postcard I started with. It's dated 1910, and let's look at when radium was discovered. Let's go to the Wikipedia website. Radium, in the form of radium chloride, was discovered by Marie and Pierre Curie in 1898 from ore mined at Yakimov. They extracted the radium compound from uraninite and published the discovery at the French Academy of Sciences five days later. Radium was isolated in its metallic state by Marie Curie and André-Louis Debierne through the electrolysis of radium chloride in 1911. Only 12 years have passed since the discovery of radium by Marie Curie and her husband. Are people already fantasizing about how they will use this radium? Or maybe they've already seen how fireplaces with this element work. I doubt the fantasy. I know how much this radium cost when it was mined. Let's talk about that. What do we know about this discovery? In 1898, the couple Pierre Curie and Marie Curie Isklodowska discovered two elements that emit rays. One, discovered in July, was called polonium in honor of Marie's homeland in Poland. But the second element, which they discovered in December, was called radium in honor of the Latin word radius, ray. 
and they did it according to the official story in terrible conditions. Some shed with an earthen floor, where Mary and her husband washed the first radium in basins with their bare hands. Then they died of radiation sickness and were buried in lead coffins, which cannot be opened for a thousand years. No, that never happened at all. That's my imagination. You can look at it differently now. It turns out Pierre didn't die of radiation sickness. Then what did he die of? He died under the hooves of a horse-drawn carriage. I think it's not a coincidence if we find out who he and his wife were socializing with. Masha Sklodovskaya herself, who worked with radioactive elements of enormous power without protection, lived for many more years. Two years after her husband's death, she had a lover, younger than her by five years. Apparently, 12 years of unprotected work with uranium, radium, and polonium had no effect on her female libido. And here is a photo of her second daughter, whom she gave birth to while wearing a vial with one gram of radium on her chest, which served as a nightlight in the evening. As you look at these photos, keep in mind that one gram of radium radiates as much as a ton of uranium ore. Marie's second daughter, Eva, who lived to be 102 years old. Once again, carrying a vessel of radiation for many years, she herself lived 66 years and gave birth to healthy and beautiful daughters. Now read the story. To get one gram or 0.35 ounces of pure radium, you need 100 tank cars of water, five carloads of various chemicals, 100 carloads of coal, and most importantly, several carloads of uranium ore. For one gram or 0.35 ounce of pure radium, it was necessary to pay about $100,000. According to the official story, Pierre and Marie Curie were poor. Who paid for their research? With the assistance of geophysicist Edouard Suess, then president of the Austrian Academy of Sciences, the Austrian-Hungarian government agreed to give the Curies a ton of uranium resin cheating. But the other 10 tons were paid for by the millionaire Baron Edmund Rothschild, who was the customer, sponsor, and curator of these experiments. It is quite possible that Edmund knew what and how to look for, attracting talented scientists and paying for their experiments. He probably wanted to restore the production of that radium that had been under the previous civilization, which he most likely succeeded in doing, judging by the longevity of Marie's life, and the health of her children. But the rest of the people were forever discouraged from using radium. It started to be used everywhere in soap, toothpaste, chocolate, tea, coffee, food, cigarettes, cosmetics, bath salts, and for medical purposes, to name a few. Just at the cost of one gram of radium or 0.35 ounces, equal to 200 kilograms or 440 pounds of gold, they hardly started putting even a picture of radium in these products. Then, thorium and other isotopes were found there, but there was no radium at all. Naturally, many people died, but the effect was obtained. Now, when people hear the word radiation, they shy away. There were other heating systems besides the fireplace. Let's take a look at the cast iron stoves of the 19th century. Heating and cooking cast iron stove Everything is clear here. There is a door for laying firewood of normal length. There is an oven and a pipe for the removal of smoke and combustion products. Cast iron heating and cooking stove of the Kiffy T. Ix century. The principle is the same here, but the chimney is probably at the rear. Even just to repeat such a thing, if it is possible today, would require a change in the entire production of cast iron. And everything is clear here but it is not clear why there is a door at the very top and what size the wood should be. Coal is obviously not the way to go. In our backward past, there were amazing opportunities for artistic casting of such products. A cast iron stove from the 19th century. Note the hot air holes on the top lid. But even if we take away the aesthetic side, the technical side is quite surprising. How much will one stove be enough and how many such stoves would be needed to heat huge rooms in old houses? Wouldn't it have been easier to make one big one? Very small stoves. And here's a stove already with a cup. Amazing 19th century. 
a tent version of a fireplace. You could put a stove like this in a car. I just wish I knew how to use it. Radiation sign on the door. And if we assume that in these stoves, not in all of them, of course, were inserted elements, releasing heat, like uranium, then everything falls into place. Now there is more and more information coming out that shows that we know very little about radiation. A cast iron furnace labeled radium. Only such ovens could heat huge castles and rooms. And the pipes in them were designed to remove odors. I think that these stoves were originally made to use fuel cells that could emit heat rays. Just those who got these stoves with some stock of elements used this stock and then began to use them for the use of wood and coal. The same applies to fireplaces and castles, which are simply not suitable for open fires due to inefficient venting of the burnt gases. It is like making a fire on the floor under a shed, and the efficiency of such fireplaces on wood is practically zero. In front of the fireplace, your face is burning, and on the side, you freeze. Of course, it is possible that such fireplaces worked not only from fuel radiating elements, but also from atmospheric electricity. It's just that the people who got this inheritance had to remodel them for firewood. Thank you all so much for watching the video to the end. Share with your friends and family. Subscribe to the channel and see new videos.